Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here tonight and to follow these other two wonderful speakers um, with whom I agree about everything you've just said. So what I want to do in my time is just to talk a little bit about communication and in a way to reinforce some of the points that have already been made, but with specific reference to climate science and to the, this larger question that we face both as a society at large and as professional scientists in communicating to the public the fact that there's a reason why those 100-year storms are coming more often now, that we live in a world where our climate system is changing and the climate system is complicated and the relationship between the climate as a whole and individual weather events is a difficult one to pin down and explain. But nevertheless, the reality is that we are living in a world in which our climate is changing, and that climate change, that changing climate will be experienced by most of us as weather events. So let me just talk a little bit about communication in general. I'm a sort of accidental communicator. I have no professional training in science communication, but I became a communicator sort of inadvertently when I began to work on climate science and the history of climate science, and I began to get invitations to talk about it because, as my husband said, the scientists I knew couldn't do it. <laughs> I mean, my career has sort of been built a lot on scientists' failures. That's kind of a strange place to be in, but it's the truth. The climate science community, Mike said how climate scientists have been really affected at promoting their message, but that's actually a very recent phenomenon. And it's actually a reaction to the realization that climate scientists had actually failed rather badly. So why had climate scientists failed? Why hadn't climate scientists communicated more effectively to the American people? Uh, we saw a statistic about denial. 20, I think it's actually 25% of Americans still don't believe that smoking causes cancer. And we know that a large proportion of our fellow citizens, something like 40 to 50%, still have questions or doubt or in denial about the reality of man-made climate change. A lot of our fellow citizens accept now that something's happening to the climate. We can kind of see it. Things are changing. But a very significant number of our fellow citizens still question whether or not the observed changes are due to the things that scientists are telling us they're due to, um, specifically the increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So why don't scientists communicate more? Why don't scientists talk about what we know? Why don't we explain what we know? Why aren't we more proud of what we know and what we've accomplished? And why don't we you know, tell people about the amazing and great things that we do as scientists? Well, I've talked to a lot of scientists about this. And sometimes scientists say, well, I don't have time. I'm busy. I'm busy doing my real work. This is my real job. That's not my job. Many, many times I've heard scientists say to me, that the job of explaining climate science is the job of journalists like Dan. Um, but of course, journalists will say, no, that's actually not my job. Dan will say, my job is to forecast the weather. So we haven't really, by and large, as communities, accepted the idea of communicating to the public as part of our job. And so I think one of the most important things that we can do as a community is to embrace that and to say, yes, it is part of our job. Because if we don't do it, no one else will. And if we don't do it, other people will fill in and say things that aren't true. And in a minute, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So I think we need to do it. I think we need to accept it. And I think we need to support our colleagues to spend some proportion of their time uh, accepting that just as if we're university professors, we spend time on research and teaching. I like to think of the communication piece as part of the teaching part of my job. That my university says that I teach and do research, but I don't think of that teaching as only taking place in the classroom or only taking place in my meeting with my graduate students. My role as a teacher, well, it's happening right here today. It happens every time I go and speak in public or every time I write an opinion piece for a newspaper. That's part of my teaching mission as well. You can also think of it as part of your service mission, that part of we, what we do as scientists and academics and meteorologists is we serve the communities that support us and pay for the work that we do. And so part of that service should be not just doing the forecast, but also explaining the forecast and explaining how we know the things that we know. And in my experience, when you do that, when you take the time to do that, people are generally extremely appreciative. Um, I was just telling a colleague just now, I've been to something like 
45 of the 50 states talking about climate science. And I've gone to places that many of my colleagues consider hostile territory, like Texas, um, and Oklahoma, and Kansas, and North Dakota. And every time I've gone to a place like that, it's always been a wonderful experience, and people are appreciative. And one of the best moments I had ever on a book tour was when a woman in Hayes, Kansas, said to me, bless you for coming to Hayes. So people are appreciative, and there's a lot of reward for doing this kind of work. But I've also had a lot of scientists say to me that one reason they don't like to do public communication is because if they do, and they say something that their colleagues think is oversimplified, or a little bit overblown, or possibly goes a little bit too far in terms of what we might know, let's say, about the relationships between climate change and hurricanes, for example, that they get slammed by their colleagues, that their colleagues criticize them very harshly and will really criticize them sometimes in faculty meetings, sometimes in public, or sometimes privately. And so scientists feel cowed by their own colleagues. And I think that's really, really problematic. I think one of the most important things that we need to do as a community is to chill out and be nicer to each other and to realize that public communication isn't always easy. And it's not always easy to find exactly the right way to explain what the relationship is between climate change and hurricane intensification or what the relationship is between climate change and sea level rise. These things are complicated. It's not always easy to take a complicated and in some cases still somewhat contested scientific issue and explain it in a clear and simple way. But that doesn't mean we should criticize our colleagues for trying. And it seems to me that if you hear a colleague say something in public that you don't think is quite right, the best thing to do would be to politely say or send an email and say, wow, that was great that you gave that public talk. It was great that you wrote that piece. And my suggestion, my positive constructive criticism is, you know, here's some information or here's an article that I wrote about that. And people do that to me. And when I receive an email from a colleague with an article about some update on some issue, I'm always really appreciative of that because it, it helps me do my job better. So I think we can help and support each other um, in that way. When I was a graduate student, Carl Sagan was on television. And I can remember lots of faculty and professors criticizing Carl Sagan, accusing him of being a grandstander, being egotistical, narcissistic, you know, loving being on television. And maybe he was egotistical and narcissistic. But Carl Sagan did an incredible amount of good for the American scientific community by communicating to the American people the wonder and the thrill and the excitement of doing scientific work. So my message to all of us is to support each other, to help each other, and not to criticize people if they get some detail wrong. OK, so another thing scientists sometimes say is we don't communicate in public because we don't know how. And I think it is true that public communication is not an entirely trivial thing. It takes practice to do it well. Some people are more comfortable in front of an audience than others. Um, some scientists should not be let out in public. Um, <laughs> but most of us actually do know how to communicate. And I want to share a story with you about this. So I was at NCAR a couple of years ago. That's good. Everybody here knows what NCAR is. I don't have to explain it. Um, I was at NCAR with a group of climate scientists who wanted, it was a, a workshop on climate communication and on this question about how the NCAR community could do, be doing a better job in communicating to the public. And one of the very, one of the leading scientists, they're a very famous person, someone who's probably at this meeting this week, said, I don't know how to talk to the public about what I do. I don't know how to talk to ordinary people about my work. And lots of people nodded their heads and said, yes, we don't know how to talk to ordinary people about our work. And I said, okay, I want to ask a question. How many of you have children? Most people raised their hands. I'll do this with you. How many of you have children? Okay. How many of you, if you keep your hands up, if keep your hand up if sometimes you talk to your children about your work? OK, keep your hand up if you talk to your children about your work in exactly the same way you talk to your colleagues about your work. <laughs> OK, so we do know how to talk about our work in different ways. We talk to our children, we talk to our spouses, we talk to family members, we talk to people in our churches and our synagogues, we talk to our barber or hairdresser. We do actually know how to talk 
about our work in different ways. We just don't know that we know. We're like the scarecrow in the Wizard of Oz. You know, we just don't have that diploma. So part of my message is you do know how to talk about your work. It's not that incredibly hard, but it does sometimes take a little practice, and so you have to get out there and do it. I think you also have to, as I said, we have to be kind to each other. We also have to be kind to ourselves. Um, I was at a meeting one time with a group of meteorologists who started fighting about the following issue, and some of you maybe remember this. Some years ago, Al Gore said that climate change was like loading the dice. And we were loading the dice, and by loading those dice, we were going to increase the odds that we would have you know, Category 5 hurricanes or terrible tornadoes or whatever it was. And a bunch of climate scientists got upset, and they said, no, that was the wrong metaphor. It's not like loading the dice. It's like painting an extra dot on the dice. And then these scientists started having a big fight with each other about which was the right metaphor. And they were getting very heated about it. And I finally said, guys, it's a metaphor, <laughs> right? I mean, the whole point about a metaphor is it's supposed to communicate an idea. It doesn't have to be exact. OK, so these are all reasons um, why climate communication can be difficult, science communication can be difficult, but we can do it. And we can do it well. And when you do it, it is gratifying and rewarding. Now, one other thing scientists have sometimes said to me is, well, I'm afraid that if I talk about climate change, I'll be attacked. And this is a real fear and a real problem. And I hope that all of you will stay after our discussions to watch the film Merchants of Doubt, because that's what that film is about. And I want to just spend a few minutes now talking about the work I've done and thinking through this question about how we can cope with the, very rea the reality with which we live, which is that we do live in a world in which science and scientists get attacked. So I wrote the book Merchants of Doubt because I had been attacked. As Dan said, in 2004, I published an article in Science, peer-reviewed article, in which I said there's a consensus in the scientific community that man-made climate change is underway. And it was based on taking a line, a specific line, out of the US National Academy of Sciences, a report from the National Research Council that said most of the observed warming over the past 50 years is likely to have been due to the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. And I wanted to get a sense of how well did that academy report represent the views of rank and file working scientists. And so I asked the question, if we look at papers in peer reviewed journals, what proportion of these papers, papers disagree with that statement? So it was a very clear thing I was asking. And we took a random sample of 1,000 papers out of the web of science. And the answer we found was none. That in our sample, there were no papers in peer reviewed scientific literature that provided evidence, data, theoretical arguments, modeling, to say that the academy was incorrect in that claim. And I published that result. And frankly, I didn't actually think it would be all that controversial, because I knew that all the scientists around me knew that that was true. I published it really because I thought journalists were getting it wrong. And I thought that journalists were just confused. And if they read my paper, then the confusion would be cleared up, and we would all go home and be happy. Well, that didn't happen. Instead, what I realized was that I had kind of gone through an Alice through the looking glass kind of moment, moved into a parallel universe of science denial. And as soon as that paper came out, I started getting attacked. I started getting hate email, threatening phone calls. Um, I was attacked on the floor of the US, Senator, uh, US Senate. Um, I got a phone call from a man in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who said, did you know that Senator James Inhofe is criticizing you? And I was like, hello? What? Does James Inhofe even know who I am, right? Um, so it was a very strange thing. And I, one thing led to another, and I ended up doing research to try to find out who were the people who were attacking me. And why would a senator from Oklahoma attack a historian of science who just wrote a paper saying, hey, here's what scientists are saying? I mean, the paper didn't say anything about what we should do about climate change, didn't recommend any policy strategies, just said, here's what scientists are trying to tell us. And that turned out to be an incredibly controversial thing. So I ended up with my colleague Eric Conway writing a book about it. The book has become a film. And one of the things that we learned is that there has been in this country for more than two decades an organized 
structured, well-financed campaign to challenge climate science because there are many people in this country who do not want us to take the steps that it would require to mitigate dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. That's the reality, and that's a reality that most of us as scientists are not prepared for. Most of us, when we became scientists, we never thought that we would have to defend ourselves against organized climate denial or organized science denial. It wasn't even something we ever thought about. It wasn't anything anyone ever mentioned. We went into science because we loved science, because we were good at math, or because we liked problem solving, or because we liked questions that had definite answers, or because we thought hurricanes were cool, or in my case, because I loved rocks and minerals, or fossils, or we just thought the natural world was incredibly interesting. And to be able to spend a lifetime to earn a living understanding the natural world, and maybe in the process also saving people's lives or producing the mineral resources that our world depends on, what a great thing. And whoever thought, oh, and let me prepare to defend myself against politicians who are going to attack me for doing science. No, none of us thought about that. And none of our graduate advisors ever warned us or prepared us for that. So I think as a community and as individuals, we've all been kind of blindsided by the difficult political reality that we've had to live through. And of course, now some of us have realized that we're actually not alone, that some of what we've dealt with is actually very similar to what our colleagues in evolutionary biology have to face. And we've actually learned it's similar to what some of our colleagues who work on in toxicology and oncology have had to face. But we never really knew about that because we never talked to toxicologists or evolutionary biologists. We always just talked to our fellow colleagues in our own areas of expertise. So I guess if I have any other message about communication, it's also about learning from each other. There's a lot we can learn from other scientists who have grappled with issues that are maybe not identical, but are in many ways similar. And the whole point of our book, and a major point of the film, is really to show these similarities and to show that even though the experience of climate scientists seems weird and strange, it's sadly not unique. But we can learn from those experiences. We can learn from what scientists have experienced. And we can learn from how other scientists have dealt with these challenges and in the future do a better job communicating the facts, celebrating our successes, protecting people from hurricanes and tornadoes that can kill them, and just helping everyone understand how actually amazing and beautiful and complex this planet Earth is that we live on. And it's something to cherish and to enjoy and to be glad and proud that we have the capacity to understand it. Thank you very much. <laughs>